Well, hello, Parker Hill. My name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. And this is the next part in our series, How to Be Brave. And learning to lead courageous lives is something we all need to learn to do for ourselves. And the last couple of weeks in the series have been amazing. And if you missed them, I want to encourage you to go back and watch them online or using the Parker Hill app. And if you want to see them again to, to learn how to be brave or you want to share it with a friend, you could do that online or with the app as well. Now this week we're going to talk about everyone's favorite subject, your weaknesses. It's your favorite, right? Your weaknesses. In fact, all of us have weaknesses and all of us have strengths. We're all made up of these weird combinations of both. There's things that you're naturally good at, right? Things that you've worked really hard to get good at. There's things that you're naturally bad at and things that you've worked really hard to get bad at. We call those bad habits. We're all made up of these strengths and weaknesses. But if we're going to talk about weakness, we need to define it. And one dictionary defines weak as lacking the power to perform a demanding task liable to break or give way under pressure. Weakness says that there is a gap between what's needed and what you can deliver. A, a gap in your parenting, a gap in your energy, a gap in your knowledge, or your financial stewardship, a gap in your experience, a gap in your love life, a gap in your integrity, a gap in your self-control. And where the gap is, that's where you're weak. And the thing about weakness is that we all have them, but we wish that we didn't. There wasn't a day in your life when you woke up and you said, wow, I really wish I could get lost every time I try to go somewhere new. That would be great. No, you just have that weakness. Not everyone has that great internal compass that never fails them. And the thing about weakness is that everyone else knows your weaknesses, the people around you enough, who've observed your life enough, they know where your weaknesses are, even if you don't. It's like when someone put a, a kick me sign on your back in school. Everyone else sees it. You can't. No one wants to tell you about it because if they did, well, it's embarrassing. You know what's funny? We all have weaknesses, but we act like we don't. And we all can see other people's weaknesses, but we act like they don't exist. Consequently, the thing about weaknesses is that our weaknesses become the lid to our lives. They stop us short in life. And they do that because we avoid situations where our weaknesses would be revealed. We avoid circumstances where we'll fall short. No one wants to be embarrassed or worse, rejected. And we think that if we reveal or show our weaknesses, if we enter into circumstances where we might not be perfect, we might not have it all together, where there might be a gap, we think if we enter into those and show our, our weakness, we'll never live it down. Therefore, the problem, don't miss this, the problem is not our weaknesses. The problem is our fear. We don't engage in areas where we're afraid we're going to fall short. For instance, every year, some of the staff at Parker Hill, they go golfing. Just a fun day, and uh, they go out and they go golfing, and, and I think golf is cool, uh, but I'm not any good at it. And so uh, an email comes out every year saying, okay, it's the time of year, who wants to go golfing? And, and uh, I don't reply. And they send a little, an email a little while later, and they say, you know, everyone's invited. It's just for fun. Can you make it? And I don't reply. And then another email comes. This is the last one. And they say, last call. Who's in? And I don't answer it. But if in that very same inbox on that very same day, I get an email from our student pastors, and they say, hey, Dan, would you like to speak in front of 150 teenagers about purity I say, hmm, yes, I'll do it. Wait a second. What is going on there? See, we're afraid to engage in circumstances where we feel we will fall short. The problem is not my lack of golfing skills, though that is a weakness. My problem is I'm afraid of being embarrassed. So now everybody knows why I don't answer those emails. Now, here's what happens in our lives. An, an opportunity comes your way. Someone challenges you to step up. You feel a stirring to do something important. And we pretend that the reason that we don't engage, 
that we don't step out and that we don't try. The reason that we don't do it, we say, we say it's because I don't have enough. We say it's because of the gap. We say it's because of the weakness. We say I can't because I don't have enough and you can fill in the blank. I can't commit to that because I don't have enough time. I can't be a leader at school because I don't have enough experience. I can't try out for that team because I don't have enough skills. I can't go to Kenya or Haiti because I don't have enough money. I can't go on the fall retreat trip because I don't have enough friends. I I can't engage with my kids because I just don't have enough energy at the end of the day. I can't talk to that person about my faith because I don't have enough knowledge. We say that the reason that we don't engage is because we don't have something, don't have enough. And we think it's our weaknesses that are holding us back, but it's not. It's our fear. We don't engage in areas where we're afraid we will fall short. And let me just say up front that not all fear is bad. Some fear is good. It can keep you from running out into a road or touching a hot stove. And making some decisions based on your weaknesses can be wise. But when you have a job to do, when God has a plan for you, when there's something that has your name on it but you won't engage with it because of your weakness, that is fear. And we need to figure out how to be brave. And so there's a guy in the Bible by the name of Gideon. He's going to give us insight on how to tackle this problem. We're going to be in Judges chapter 6 and 7 here today. You can get there in your Bible or Bible app now, or you can follow along on the side screens. Now, the story of Gideon is the longest story in the book of Judges. And so there's a lot in these two chapters. So here's what we're going to do. For the sake of time, we're going to read some, and we're going to summarize some, starting in the beginning, which sets up the stage of the events that we're going to See unfold in verse 1. It says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, that's their enemy, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Now you see the situation that Gideon is in? And Gideon was an Israelite. And the Israelites were farmers. And so every year they'd give themselves to working the land so that they can reap the harvest. But every year, right before they were about to reap the harvest of all their hard labor, their enemies would invade and sweep through, stealing all of their food and destroying much of what was left. And so after years and years and years of this happening, the Israelites realized that God was trying to get them to course correct in life. And they cried out to him and asked him to deliver them. The next four verses tell us that God sent a messenger, calling them back to him. But he didn't just send a messenger. He decided he was going to raise up a man to deliver them. The man's name was Gideon. We're going to find out where he was in all of this in verse 11, where it says this. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash. uh, Your guess is as good as mine. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press because he wanted to hide from the Midianites. Now, a wine press is not an ideal location to do this kind of work. In fact, a wine press was just a a smallish pit carved out of a rocky ground. And so seeing Gideon here, we learn three things. First, he's afraid of losing his crop. Second, he is hot and sweaty from doing work in a cramped space that oxen are supposed to do in an open space. And we also know that this isn't the first time that he's been in this situation. This has been going on for seven years, and that kind of thing takes a toll on a person. So get the picture. Gideon is weak. Gideon is not in a place where he'd want to be in life. And it's into these circumstances that God shows up, and he sits beneath a terebinth tree like this one, and they have a conversation, a life-changing conversation. Look at verse 12. 
It says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Is that funny to you? Because that was funny to Gideon. God could not have said something further from his present reality. And Gideon, hot and sweaty, beat up, and probably fed up, pushes back. And at this point, he doesn't seem to realize he's talking to God. That's the angel of the Lord, God showing up to talk to him in person. And so he responds like this is some kind of uh, important person, doesn't know who he is, but he'll be polite. Verse 13, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. See, Gideon first objects to what God said first, that part where he said, the the Lord is with you. Gideon's like, really? (laughs) The The way I heard it is that when God is with you, no one can stand against you. He says, I grew up with stories hearing about how God had delivered our people from the armies of Egypt. That's what happens when God is with us, and that is not happening right now. Therefore, God's not with us. And God kind of agrees. He says, that is what happens when I'm with you to deliver you, and I am with you to deliver you now. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have, And save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Gideon is doubtful. And he has a second objection to God's original statement. You know the part where Gideon is called a mighty warrior. Verse 15 says this. Pardon me, my Lord. Always polite. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. So Gideon looks at the challenge of defeating Israel's enemies. Then he looks at himself and he notices there's quite a gap in between. There's a gap. I'm weak. I lack the power to perform such a demanding task. I'm liable to break or to give way under pressure. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. It reminds me of those Russian doll toys, you know, where you you have one big one and then you open it up and there's another smaller one in and then you open that one up and there's a smaller one and you keep going until you get to the smallest one. And Gideon says, that's me. Israel is weak. (laughs) Keep going down the line. And in Israel, my tribe is the weakest. And in my my tribe, my my family is the weakest. And in my family... (laughs) I'm the weakest. So if you want someone to lead Israel to some great military victory, I'm not the guy. I mean, do you know who I am? I don't have enough warriors. I don't have enough strength. I don't have enough military training. I don't have enough. And God doesn't say, yes, you have enough warriors. And, you know, yes, you're stronger than you think. And, and yes, I'll give you some military training. God responds to Gideon's weakness with a promise. God responds to the gap by offering to fill it himself. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I'll be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites because I will be with you, leaving none alive. God says, you don't have enough, but you do have me. And here's the thing about weaknesses that you need to understand. And if you don't remember anything, you don't write anything down, write this down, put this in your phone, remember this. Where you see a liability, God sees an opportunity. When you look at your life and you see the gap, where you see a liability, God sees an opportunity. You're not enough doesn't disappoint God. It makes him excited. Your weakness is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Because where you see a liability, God's like, ooh, good, good, good. Here's my opportunity. And so Gideon is starting to think that he's talking to someone other than just some dude. He starts to realize maybe this is a messenger from God. Maybe this is God. And so he asks uh, for a sign. You know, show me that this is really from God, that God is really in it. And God does. He performs a sign and confirms that it's all from him. And so Gideon believes that God has called him 
a weak son in a weak tribe, in a weak nation, to win a war. And that night, God gives Gideon his first mission, to tear down his father's idol to Baal. And taking the small step of courage, starting in his own backyard, Gideon does it. Now, for the sake of time, we need to scrub ahead in the story to verse 33 where it tells us that the Midianites had joined forces with other nations and they were coming to ravage the land like they did every single year. Now, it's one thing for Gideon to believe that God wants him to do something big and to step out and do the little thing. It's one thing to tear down an idol. It's another thing to lead an army. And Gideon looks at the challenge and he he looks at himself and he says, there's a gap. And so he goes to God with this request in verse 36. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you promised, I just want to make sure here, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all around the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day and he squeezed the fleece and and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water is the result. Gideon sees the gap. And he wants some assurance that God is in this because if he's not, he's in for a world of hurt. And so God graciously confirms his calling. But Gideon is still a little concerned. I mean, this is life or death. He is going to go into battle. And he really wants to make sure that this is God doing this thing. I mean, can you blame him for wanting to be sure? And so he comes to God again one more time in verse 39, where it says, Then Gideon said to God, "Don't, don't be angry with me. Let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, and this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry, and all the ground was covered with dew. Now confident, finally, that God is going to lead him and use him to defeat Israel's enemies, Gideon does the next logical thing, the next thing that you and I would probably try to do. He tried to raise the largest army that he could. And the way that he did the math, he said, well, the more people I have, the greater my chances of winning. It's a time-tested warfare tactic, and he takes advantage of it. Now, the story picks up in chapter 7, where Gideon has assembled an army of 32,000 men. Now, remember, the Midianites, when they came in with all the other nations, they were they were called, they were like the locust, uh, uh, a plague. They were like more than you could count. And so, man, every person he can get, <laughs> he's going to try to get everyone. But God doesn't like the odds. Verse 1, early in the morning, Jerob Baal, that's Gideon, that's his new name since he took out that idol, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now put yourself in Gideon's shoes. Uh, Too many men? What? Wait a minute. That's like too much pizza or too much of Disney World. There's like no such thing. Too many? God says too many. If you win with these men, you'll think you did it. And so God goes about shrinking the army, verse 3. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. So the fearful fall away, and the numbers take a big hit. 22,000 leave, 10,000 are left. Gideon's like, okay, now can we fight? God says, no, I'm not done, subtracting. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. And if I say, this, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So let me summarize what happens next, right? God winnows out those who drink the water in a certain way. And in the end, he subtracts 9,700 men, leaving just 300. So from 32,000 to 300. God subtracted the 22, and then the 9,700, leaving just 300, a pitiful fraction of what Gideon had started with. Verse 8, so Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300, who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Okay, it's all down to these guys now. Now, do you remember what happened in chapter 6? 
In chapter 6, Gideon's objection, like, I, I can't do this, is, I can't do this because I'm too weak. And then here we are in chapter 7, and God has an objection. He says he has a reason why he can't make this thing happen. And, and of course he can, but why won't he? He says, I can't because you're too strong. Huh. So God responds to this objection by saying, where you see a liability, I see an opportunity. Your weakness is not the problem. Your strength is. Now, it's not wrong to be strong. God is saying, when you live like you don't need me, you're making a big mistake. And God wants to do things in and through us that are bigger than we could accomplish on our own. Have you ever stepped out? You step out to do something that you thought God wanted you to do, and then you face hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. You step out to give your kids a godly upbringing that you never had, but it's so hard just to get them to go to church. Or you step out to start a ministry, but you can't get the support you were expecting. Or you step out to share your faith at work, but the results are just so disheartening. You step out expecting God to do a miracle, but first, God makes it difficult. And he subtracts. Friends bail on you, and he subtracts. The kids revolt against you, and he subtracts. The sickness overtakes you. The cancer weakens you. The church fails you, and he subtracts. And you wonder, if God is with me, why is it this bad? I mean, maybe he's not in this. Maybe I misheard him. Maybe I'm not supposed to be even doing this. But God is not done yet. Your weakness is not the problem. Your confidence in your own strength is. See, when you started out, you thought, well, this is going to be hard, but God is with me so we can do it. But now after all these hits, after all this heartache, after all these oppositions, after all this subtraction steals your confidence, you think, well, if it was barely possible before, it's impossible now. I mean, the window of opportunity has passed. The timing is all wrong now. It's not going to work. And God says, your liability is an opportunity for me. Now is the perfect time. Let's go to work. Your weakness is not the problem, but your strength might be. And some of you have given up because God didn't show up when you expected. He's not done yet. He's just making sure that when you win, everyone knows it was him. Let's jump back in. Chapter 7, verse 8. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. And during that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura, and listen to what they're saying. And afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. Man, I love this, right? God just knows Gideon. Like, they got a thing going now. He knows how uncertain Gideon is, how fearful he is. He knows that Gideon's going to say, well, okay, can you just make it perfectly clear that this is you? Can you make this, make this obvious that this is you? I just want to make sure. Can we do a fleece thing here? And God goes, I know what's coming, so here's what I'm going to do. I'll set up a situation ahead of time because I love you, and I'm going to have you go down. Instead of asking for it, I'm just going to give it to you. And so to give, God confident, give Gideon confidence in God, he heads down to the camp, verse 12. It says, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend a dream. Huh, must be God that set this up. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. Maybe he ate something before he went to bed. But it struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this could be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. This is definitely a miracle because who hears a dream about a rolling piece of, uh, you know, loaf of bread and then says it's the, it's the destruction of our whole army. I don't know. God's working there, right? And so when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Now, sometimes Gideon gets criticized for doubting God. I don't think he doubted God. I think he doubted himself. 
I think the gap loomed large in his mind. And he knew if this was going to work, it would have to be all God. You got to look at how God treated Gideon, and he, he didn't get fed up with him. He wasn't annoyed, and, and he didn't come down on him like, why are you asking again? Instead, God worked with him. He didn't criticize him. And you might be here today, and God has called you to do something or to be someone, to grow an impact or in character. But you've hit so many obstacles that you've kind of given up. I and mean, maybe not completely, but you've you kind of stepped back. It's on hold. Or you're not pushing too hard into it. Or you're not going to take any risks right now because you're just not sure. You know what we learn about God from this passage? God isn't criticizing your uncertainty. Right now, he's working toward your victory. Gideon finally has the confidence that God is in this. And so going out in, in God's strength and not in his own, he heads to speak in front of his men. Now, do you remember the guy who had this life-changing conversation in front of a terabith tree, right? That same guy who said, hey, God, you got the wrong dude. Right. Can't be me. God isn't with us, and I am certainly not a mighty warrior. You remember that guy? That same man now stands before his small band of warriors, his few, who will face overwhelming odds, and he courageously declares this. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. And when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. And so they did. Verse 22 tells us the results. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other. There's confusion and chaos, and they start killing their own people, and the army starts to flee, thinking they are overcome. And so they win. And during Gideon's lifetime, the people had 40 years of peace. So what do we do with our gap? What do we do when our, our weakness looks like there'll be no chance of us winning? Well, I, was, I want to suggest a simple process that we just watch Gideon go, uh, go through over and over again. I want to encourage you to ask, A-S-K. First, the A. A is acknowledge it to God. You know, we do a lot of things with our weaknesses, don't we? We avoid situations where they'll be revealed. We uh, draw attention to our strengths. We lower the bar so we can kind of close the gap. We cover them up. We blame other people for them. We excuse them. We give up on even trying. Why not just go talk to God about it? Why not take your weakness into his presence and acknowledge it? I mean, he already knows. Why not just talk to him? Because where you see a liability, he sees an opportunity. And he's just waiting for us to admit that we're weak so that he can be strong for us. S, surrender it to God. This is where you're like, God, I don't know if I can beat this alone. God, I don't even know if I have the strength to try again. God, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not even sure if I should try anymore. But I surrender it to you. The gospel gives us confidence to surrender our weaknesses to God. I mean, if God saw everything about us but still chose to die for us. I mean, if God saw everything bad about us and decided that he still wanted to offer the life of his son for us. If God has love like that, then we can have confidence that we can come into his presence with our, our weaknesses. It's not scary anymore. When a God who sees and knows everything chooses to accept you and love you anyway. And you might be here today and you say, well, I don't know God like that. I mean, when I imagine God, I think of him as distant and disapproving. Well, I'm glad to be the one to tell you that God loves you enough to die for you. And that he wants to have a relationship with you. And we have a group that you just heard about meeting on Sunday mornings coming up on October 15th called Starting Point. And that is the place where you can, you can be with other people asking the same questions that you are asking and figure out what you believe as you're on this journey of faith. Okay, keep at it with God. You just got to take the next step. Keep at it with God. You ask, you surrender, and then you take a step. You ask, you surrender, then you take a step. You can start small. You can start in your own backyard like Gideon did, but take the next step. You really have to learn to keep going because life is a lot like that game um, whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole, 
right? You know this arcade game, like at Chuck E. Cheese, you, you put in your token, you pick up the mallet, uh, and then when the mole pops up, you hit it back down. It's like as hard as you can, as fast as you can, getting it back in its place. And I can tell you that when you step up in life, people will try to knock you back down. The second that you do more or try to be more, the hits will come. And sometimes they come from the enemy that wants to take you out and would like nothing better than for you to live a safe, risk-free life and not advance the kingdom of God. And sometimes it comes from people who are jealous of you or, or who are hurt themselves because hurt people hurt people. And so that's where the hit comes from. Sometimes, tragically, the hit comes from your own team, from people that you expected to support you no matter what. And so when the resistance comes, it makes you wonder if God is truly in it. You wonder, did God really want me to do this? Did, did I really hear his voice? And God will answer that question if you will ask, and you will surrender, and you will take a step. Ask. I love how Gideon is remembered in, in the New Testament, the legacy of his life. Man, he was often fearful, totally uncertain, anything but brave starting out. But he kept asking. And because he gave God his weaknesses, God revealed his strength. Listen to what it says later in the Bible in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions in closing. What is God calling you to do? I mean, if you were to have a, a conversation with God under the terebinth tree, what is he calling you to do? Where do you find yourself saying, <laughs> yeah, but I don't have enough? Or you got the wrong guy. What is God calling you to do? And if all you think you are called to do is stuff that you can do in your own power, that's not God's plan. Which leads me to the second question. What is God calling you? I mean, what name has he given you that sounds so far from where you are that you want to laugh at it? He's saying, you're not talking to me. What name is God calling you? Is it mighty warrior? Is it courageous teenager? Is it compassionate neighbor? Godly father, soul winner, joy bringer, freedom fighter, inspiring mother. What's his name for you? What would happen if you asked? Maybe it would be said of you that their weakness was turned to strength and they became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. You overcame the gap. Just like God has done in the life of one of my real life heroes. Someone that we admire deeply around here who has all the reasons in the world to say, I don't have enough, I can't, I can't do it. But instead, she challenges me to offer the weakness that I have and let God fill the gap. This is Melissa's story. Watch this with me. Melissa's committed to the mission of helping people find the way back to God, so you can rely on her to do whatever is needed and to use her gifts in whatever way to make sure the mission is accomplished. Committed, dedicated, willing, enthusiastic, kind, loving. I mean, she's a sweet spirit. She's um, quiet and gentle, um, just a pleasure to be around, encouraging. She's dedicated. How many more Melissa's would you take? A hundred. <laughs> I have psoriatic arthritis. My disease is very aggressive and very progressive as opposed to regressive. A person with a regressive disease will go into remission and they'll be fine for months or years and then they'll have a flare and they'll go on steroids and it'll calm down and they'll be back to normal. My disease never does that, so it's always progressing always getting worse. Eventually, I will be in a wheelchair. Eventually, I won't be able to take care of myself. By the time I was 36, my hands were 
like this. My jaw was completely fused shut. I couldn't open my jaw at all. I've already had complete jaw replacement surgery. Um, and my rheumatologist said he's never seen it move this fast. I've gotten to the point where I'm not afraid to ask for help. I have people that are willing to help, so I call them when I need them. You know, do what I can do for as long as I can do it on my own, but call people when I need it. There are moments that um, I really am aware of what God is doing, and then there are other times where I'm not, um, especially in the past four or five months. Um, I have felt far from God, um, just the depression and the um, overwhelming aspects of the disability. Um, but it doesn't matter what I feel because I know that the Bible is true and I know that God is with me. He has promised that he will never forsake us. Um, and the Holy Spirit lives in me, so I will always have him, even if I don't feel it. And that's a comfort, even when the only thing I can see is the disability and the pain and the weakness. I know that he is still here and he's not let go. I moved here to Northeast Pennsylvania in 2002 to go to Baptist Bible College, now CSU, um, to get my teaching degree. So I've been here since about 2002, which is quite a while. And from the very beginning, I was volunteering in different children's ministries, different age groups, that sort of thing. The pain just got so much that I couldn't I couldn't even stand to have a little kid just bump into my legs. I mean, it was it was difficult. And I said, you know what, I really can't do this anymore. That was a heartbreaking moment for me. And for a while there, there were maybe four or five months that I wasn't volunteering at all. And I really felt sad, disconnected. Um, I felt like I wasn't contributing anything. I was sitting in a service, but not, you know, doing anything for the community. I had a picture of how I could contribute to the church. I saw myself as a teacher. I saw myself working with children. And I had to get to a point where I realized I can contribute in a different way. You know, it doesn't have to be the way I assumed it was going to be. Now I help out in the office. But I also help with the app notes. Brady sends us what the sermon's gonna be about and the different questions that they want answered. And then we just put that together. Um, we're in a rotation of about eight or 10 of us, I think. Um, so I do it like once a month or once every other month. And now I'm helping also with the puppet scripts for Mungo Land, so that's also something that I enjoy doing. You're welcome. Have a great day. Bye-bye. God can use me in whatever capacity I'm willing to be used, so I just have to be open to that and willing to change, even if I don't like change, even if I don't want to give up what I enjoy doing, but just being open to whatever He has.